to take off from south to north, climb to about 50,000 feet before that separation where VSS Unity will drop, ignite and reach supersonic speeds within literally eight seconds, reaching a top speed of 2,600 miles an hour. And that burn only lasts for like 70 seconds before they get to Apogee, their highest point, which is around 50 to 55 miles above Earth and that, that few minutes, and it is just a few minutes of weightlessness for Richard Branson and the crew before they start that gentle descent, hopefully back down to Earth. Ed, we're now just moments away, maybe seconds away from potentially the launch of a lifetime. Tell us who's on board, of course, Richard Branson and others. Yeah, the main focus, of course, is Richard Branson. Part of that dynamic intention is the race, the space race between him and Jeff Bezos to be the billionaire, to go in on their own company's craft. He is principally on board to test the experience of paying customers, of civilian astronauts, what it will be like for those that put down $250,000 for the privilege of doing it. But a lot of this activity is also about scientific research. Beth Mo Moses, who basically leads crew training at Virgin Galactic. She will be on board evaluating the strength of the experience, how the astronauts cope, and she will be in charge of training those future civilian astronauts as well. Also, Sarisha Bandler, who is the VP of Government Affairs, she's gonna be looking at the scientific nature. She's gonna be doing an experiment in that microgravity environment to see how basically plants and their biochemistry fare coming in and out of microgravity stresses. And that's another future revenue stream for Virgin Galactic. They plan in the future to charge a higher rate, around 600,000 US dollars a pop for those few minutes of weightless scientific experiment. You also have Colin Bennett, who's making his first flight into space. He used to work for Virgin Atlantic and is now the pretty much lead engineer for operations here at Virgin Galactic. He will be up making sure that from an engineering standpoint, the cockpit and the cabin operate in the way that they should be. Ed, we, we know that there's already been one delay this morning. We still are not seeing uh, the craft take off at this point. What do we know about the latest about when it's actually going to be taken off? Yeah, so Virgin Galactic CEO Michael Colglaze has just been on stage behind me welcoming everyone that's in attendance. There's a long list of VIPs and celebs, including those that some of those that paid uh, for the privilege of going up when the service is commercially ready. We understand that Elon Musk is here. He said that we were about 10 minutes away, so we were expecting takeoff in about five minutes time from now. As far as I'm hearing from sources in the company, everything is nominal, everything is fine despite that earlier delay. And as I said, the crew had a really calm, stable morning. They were with their family and then the families lined the pathway as the crew left uh, Spaceport America here in New Mexico, entered the vehicles that drove them off to the runway. And they've been in uh, VSS Unity, basically preparing for the last 30 minutes or so. You're watching our special coverage of Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson planning to take off minutes from now from a spaceport in Truth and Consequences, New Mexico. Ed, you know better than anyone, anything goes in space, it can always be canceled a second before. They had a test flight that was aborted back in December. Um, what's it looking like now? I know we're in the middle of the, the New Mexico desert. The weather uh, is looking good, but uh, you know, what are the chances this doesn't happen today? Yeah, the biggest variable here is high winds. The, the reason that Spaceport America is here in the New Mexico desert is because there are 350 days a year of perfect, brilliant sunshine, 6,000 square feet of restricted airspace, perfect for sending up space vessels. But the biggest variant is that high wind. And, and it's dangerous because this is completely carbon composite. It's very lightweight vehicle, both uh, White Knight 2 the, the, or VS, VMS Eve that carries up VSS Unity and VSU Unity itself. So it is susceptible to wind, but right now the conditions do look good for, for takeoff. Ed, it has been a long, difficult path for Virgin Galactic to get here, absolutely decades in the making. And I can't help but think of the tragedy back in 2014 uh, that killed one pilot and badly injured another, actually happening uh, on the same class of ship as Spaceship Two, as, uh, uh, as, as VSS Unity. I'm wondering what you know about safety on board today. Yeah, so according to sources, there will be parachutes on board VSS Unity. The four crew members and the two pilots have been trained to use those parachutes as well as other safety procedures. What happened in 2014 is that on ascent, the, the Unity vessel activated its landing procedure while it was on the way up. 
at the time, the investigators found that was probably due to human error, but it raised questions about how could they possibly have a system that would allow you to start the landing procedure on takeoff. But that is what was attributed to the crash, and it's since been rectified with the latest generations of vessel that Virgin Galactic's using. Uh, Ed, thanks so much for joining us. Please stand by. We'll get back to you as soon as that launch happens. I want to bring in Chad Anderson now, founder and managing partner of Space Capital, a seed stage venture capital firm with $80 million under management. You are watching our live coverage of the Virgin Galactic launch, carrying founder Richard Branson on Bloomberg Television, radio, and quick take. Chad, you've been invested, investing in the space business for a long time. These launches happen. Um, this one is particularly more high profile, given that Richard Branson is on board. How significant in the span of, of space launch, space flight history is today? How big a milestone is this? It's significant. I mean, today is really exciting, and I'm excited to be here uh, watching with you. This is um, a new era in, in human space flight, and it's been a long time coming. I mean, so since the X Prize um, was won in 2004, uh, where Paul Allen's team made it to space twice using the experimental version of this um, spacecraft that Branson then later licensed. Um, so it's been 17 years of building and testing and getting to this point. It's been a long road, and it's you know it's fascinating for me to see that this is um, coming online at the same time as Bezos um, and, and his vehicle that's been at it for just about the same amount of time. So um, 20 years in the making, all coming to a head and two very different systems, two very different architectures and approaches coming online within about a week and a half of each other. So um, today is, is very significant and kind of ironic. You know, the, the choice of architecture with going with a carrier plane to drop the spacecraft um, was, you know, one of the, the arguments for that is that it can rise above the weather and they can launch in any weather. And that's what Virgin Orbit does, you know, says, makes the same argument for their satellite um, uh, launches that they do under the wing of a 747. So kind of ironic that the weather would delay um, this vehicle today. But no, it looks like it's going to take off and we're all very excited um, to see it happen. Chad, much has been made of the differences between Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, of course. Uh, if they do become uh, space tourist carriers, they will be direct competitors. But as you say, the technology is incredibly different. Branson will be on a, a, essentially a, a space plane today, whereas Blue Origin's New Shepard um, goes up and down. Talk to us about the differences in the technology here, the approaches of Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos. Yeah, so they're both suborbital vehicles, um, and uh, the White Knight uh, carries up the spaceship, as you see rolling out to the pad, or out to the, to the runway now. Um, and so it's about an hour and a half um, uh, total trip. Most of that is on the way up. Um, the launch actually is, is quite quick, um, and as Ed mentioned earlier, it's a 70 second duration burn. So they go basically vertical, um, and it's, going to be quite a thrill. Um, so I've done the, the centrifuge training for this. That wasn't enough to get a, an invite to this flight, but um, uh, you get six Gs through your chest. And if you've ever felt that before, I mean, it's pretty intense. You, you go through training so that you can enjoy the experience when you're up there and you don't um, pass out, for example. I mean, this is the type of G-forces that um, stunt pilots and aerial pilots go through. Um, and then they take three and a half Gs through their head as well. So um, it's an exhilarating experience, should be really fun. And then when they get up there, they've got three to four minutes of weightlessness. And then before they glide back down and land on the runway like a space shuttle. So um, Blue Origin is a vertical rocket. Um, you launch with um, a capsule on top and you sit. It's much, a little bit more spacious. The windows are bigger. Um, but you launch vertically. The whole thing takes about 11 minutes with um, Blue Origin's vehicle, um, and the capsule detaches, and you have you know similar amount of time and weightlessness before you come back down um, under parachute, similar to what the Russians do in Kazakhstan. So um, two very different approaches. I mean, from a technical perspective and also a business perspective, um, the pricing strategy, the go-to-market. Um, uh, licensing technology, which is what Branson has done versus building the whole thing from scratch, 
that Bezos has done in an effort to do, you know, to use that technology as a baseline to go on to do much bigger things. Well, for our audience live on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio and Quick Take, this is our special coverage of Richard Branson's flight into space aboard Virgin Galactic. If you are watching on video right now, what you're seeing are a live video of the carrier plane. Uh, it's uh, VS, uh, VMS Eve, uh, VMS standing for uh, Virgin Mothership, and it's carrying a VSS Unity, Virgin Spaceship, below it. Uh, Chad, you mentioned uh, Blue Origin here, and I, I got to ask you, uh, there's been so much controversy about whether or not this is actually going into space. Do, do you think that Richard Branson today will go into space? <laughs> yeah, so there's been a lot of back and forth on this. And to be, I mean, frank, the in one of their earlier flights, the FAA um, gave their pilots commercial wings. Right. So um, this is kind of an arbitrary definition of on, on, a, on a gradient where, you know, where does space start in the atmosphere end? Um, what's more interesting to me, honestly, is the fact that we are moving into an era where we have um, more people experiencing this, and the moniker astronaut is going to very quickly start to stop meaning so much, right? Suddenly, we're going to just be passengers, similar to what happened on airlines. I mean, the earliest um, folks used to get their wings when they would fly, and that was a big accomplishment. You know, I went and flew on an airplane. Um, it was reserved for only the most, you know, the wealthiest of us, celebrities flying in black ties. Um, and then there wasn't a coach class in, in airlines until the late 70s, right? They called it a tourist class. And so making um, airline travel available to, to most of us. And so you can imagine that a similar thing is going to play out here. And what I'm most interested in is that... All that right, whether, uh, Chad, whether sorry to cut that. you off, but it looks like uh, Eve... The mothership is picking up speed. Eve, of course, named after Richard Branson's own mother. And between the two planes on the end, you see the VSS Unity. That is the spaceship that will separate from Eve about 50 minutes after takeoff and then rocket up into space or to the edge of space, however you'd like to see it. It'll take Richard Branson and the crew up for five or so we believe minutes of weightlessness they haven't been super specific they've said several we believe it'll be about five minutes they will get that view of earth that so few humans have seen and then as our ed ludlow mentioned earlier the rocket will change shape in midair, which is one of the key signatures of Virgin Galactic special technology, it's, it's called feathering, the rocket will change shape for a safe re-entry back to Earth. I want to bring in our Ed Ludlow, who is on the ground watching Eve take off, carrying Richard Branson, two pilots, and three additional crew members. Ed, give us the mood on the ground. What are you feeling? It's incredible, unsurprising, unsurprising. There are cheers and claps and applause, and I could see it out of my peripheral vision. And then when it came in line with me, that high-pitched scream of the jet engine, which is a hybrid burning solid and liquid fuels and a smooth takeoff. And you have to be honest, it's an incredible moment anytime there's a space launch. But to be here on the ground in New Mexico, live on Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio and Quick Take, absolutely incredible. As you said, over the course of 45 minutes, reaching somewhere between 45,000 and 50,000 feet before VSS Unity is released. It's a call of three, two, one, release, release, release. That engine ignites and the burn within eight seconds hits supersonic speeds, a 70 second steep arc up to around 50 miles above Earth's atmosphere. And Chad was talking about the stresses on the body that you're experiencing during that time. We found out this morning that Richard Branson himself was doing some training in a sort of centrifuge, which basically simulates that experience of the G-forces running through the body. It's, it's a difficult one because now it's just a waiting game. You know, the, the way the delivery mechanism works, that dual stage process, they're just on their way up like a normal aeroplane takes off. And you wonder how those six human beings are feeling inside that spacecraft. Emily, Tim. Uh, well, for our, for our audience live on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio and Quick Take, this is our special coverage of Richard Branson's flight into space. Ed, you mentioned those passengers, the crew aboard. For the next 45 minutes, it is 
really like a, a, a traditional space flight for all intents and purposes. I mean, 50,000 feet, yeah, it's about you know 15,000 feet higher than a traditional uh, a commercial airliner travels when it goes coast to coast across the United States. Um, what do you think they're feeling right now on board? What do you think they're experiencing right now on board? What do they see in the cabin? Well, so the cabin is designed to, to maximize the experience of the paying customer, right? It is very spacious. As I said, both of the craft are made out of a very lightweight carbon composite that, that, that is designed that way to make it energy efficient, but also to, ma to minimize the kind of stuff inside, the, the dense material. It's only 68 feet long, you know, so it's not that big, but on the way up, they will be experiencing those, you know, kind of similar pressures to, to an airplane, but this airplane obviously goes much higher than say a commercial liner around 37,000 feet. This is going to 50,000 feet. You know, they have had some training, some limited training. As I said, Richard Branson's definitely had some more specific G-Force training. The whole point of this exercise, the whole point of this big media event, the world's media is gathered here, is to A, prove the technology works, but B, come back and explain what the experience is like. Because if you want to go on board, you've got to have a very healthy bank account. <laughs> Ed, uh, I, I want to bring in Chad Anderson, who's with us on set in New York. And Chad, having gone through this training, wondering what you're feeling in this moment, having invested in this industry for years on the hope, on the promise that this would be something big, that there is a big future for space tourism, that people around the world are going to want to board Virgin Galactic or Blue Origin flights for that, you know, screaming few minutes of, of weightlessness in space. Um, you know, what are you feeling as you watch Eve take off? A lot of excitement. Um, this has been, you know, we've been building to this point for a very long time and it's great to see it finally coming to, to fruition. I mean, um, they have been talking about um, getting to space later this year, I think since 2007. So it's kind of surreal to actually be watching it happen right now. Um, you have to imagine that this is all part of the experience. I mean, Virgin has, Galactic has built this into everything they've done. So it's a long waiting game. People have put down deposits. And so they've focused on everything, um, calling them future astronauts, building a, a group of folks that come together. They have events. You know, they come to Spaceport America. They, they do these weightless um, parabolic flights on jets. They do the centrifuge training. You know, it's a whole experience. And so you have to imagine that they have now taken that as well on launch day um, and people experiencing this in flight, you know, they're in a beautiful cabin, lots of windows. You have to imagine, you know, the excitement is building and they've prepared for this part of the experience as well. So, you know, you've got an hour um, to, to get excited, let your nerves settle. And, you know, that might actually make it um, much better and, and easier for you to enjoy that short period of time of intense stimulation, you know? So uh, a bit of time to sort of get your feet under you, um, get prepared um, for the thrill of a lifetime. Chad, earlier in our conversation, you drew the parallel between um, transcontinental flight, uh, around the world flight, uh, and the way that prices have come down, especially over the last few decades. And I, and I wonder when you think the price of this type of experience will get to the point where really the masses of people can experience, like they can experience buying a, a ticket on Southwest. I mean, Virgin Galactic has said they want to do 400 of these flights per year from around the world. It's more than one every day by the end of this decade. We're still so early to be having this conversation, but it's a fun one to have. So the pricing strategies of both companies have been very um, different and very interesting. Uh, Virgin Galactic came out first and started taking deposits um, and they just assumed, you know, they did some market research and they said that they think that the market can handle 250000 per ticket. And people started to put down money for that. Blue Origin, on the other hand, waited until they were ready to fly and they did a price auction, much more sort of Silicon Valley approach to pricing. And they, you know, the ultimate um, price paid was $28 million for a similar arguably similar experience. And so now we know that the ceiling is much higher and anything that they, they charge from here on out is gonna look like a discount by comparison. But more interestingly, they now have all of that information about all of the other bids that came in, how many there were, how many, you know, what people were willing to pay. And so they can now use that in their pricing strategy. We don't know what Blue Origin is going to charge um, yet, 
I've heard, you know, from reputable sources, people who would know that it's well north of five hundred thousand dollars. But we'll have to wait and see. Um, but these are these are significant significant prices in airlines. You know, it took from the first flight in the early 1900s until um, you know the late 70s for a coach class to be developed. And I hope, uh, um, you know, I think with technology today that um, and the way that things develop, I think that you know that we'll get there a whole lot faster. All right, Chad, uh, we should mention that about 700 or so people bought those initial tickets that were available uh, from Virgin Galactic on their initial flights. We believe some celebrities purchased those tickets from Tom Hanks to Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga, $250,000 a pop. And Richard Branson has said that he will have a big announcement after he lands, hopefully safely today, about giving more people that opportunity to go to space. So uh, we want to know exactly uh, what that promise will be. I want to bring in Will Whitehorn now, the former president of Virgin Galactic, uh, who is with us. Will, obviously, I imagine this is a huge moment for you. It has been a long path here. There were design changes. There were delays. There, there, there were some deaths uh, along the way. Talk to us about what this means for you today and for the entire Virgin team. Well, I think I, I left Virgin 10 years ago, but I've still stayed pretty close to this project because I've ended up working in the space industry. I have my, a satellite company I'm a shareholder and director of, which is quoted on the Swedish stock market. And we're going to be using Virgin Orbit, sister company, to launch satellites in the future. And um, I'm also running a, a new space investment company called Seraphim Space Investment Trust that starts trading on the London stock market on Wednesday. We're investing in some of the companies that actually Virgin's been looking at as well. So it's a very exciting time. It's a nervous time because obviously this is difficult stuff. You know, they've been debating about who's going higher, but they're both going into space. The NASA definition of space is 50 miles. You're in a vacuum when you're up there, you're weightless, and things can just happen because it's space. It's not easy stuff. And I think that, you know, the nervousness will recede when hopefully there'll be the joy of uh, the, you know, the, basically the inaugural flight of the company for the pre commercial period, because obviously the next group of passengers who go off this will be the first paying passengers. And Sir Richard is, is, is doing what he needs to do as the boss of the company, which is lead the way and, you know, take the company into its next era. But it's taken 15 years to get Galactic to this place. And it's been, you know, a difficult time for them. I, I, I went part time to do this project for Virgin, my last five years of a 25 year career there. And it was extremely difficult stuff we were doing. We were working with carbon composite a new material for, for use in space to a large extent, a new type of rocket motor, the feathering device that allows the re-entry without the, the, the craft burning up. All of these were brand new groundbreaking technologies. And at the same time, we laid the groundwork for what is now Virgin Orbit, which to me is actually just as exciting a business, being able to launch satellites from anywhere in the world in groups of up to 10 into low Earth orbit. And it's going to be along with SpaceX what makes this industrial revolution we're about to have in space happen. So this day really heralds an industrial revolution. For our audience live on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, and Quick Take, this is our special coverage of Richard Branson's flight into space. Will, you talked about a new industrial revolution. Will Whitehorn, former Virgin Galactic president, uh, what is the conversation that we are having 15 years from now? You said this was 15 years in the making. What's the conversation that we're having 15 years from now? What's going on well, in our skies? In in 2018, there were about 2,000 working satellites in space. Today, it's about 3,500. By the end of this year, it'll be nearly 5,000. In 15 years' time, there'll not only be 100,000 satellites up there, but I believe we'll have all of our server farms or data centers, as people call them in space. We'll have most of our broadband from space. We will have mobile phones that work anywhere in the world because they'll be satellite-enabled. We'll be beaming down microwave power to receiving stations all over the planet and getting 24 seven reliable microwave solar energy from space. What about we will be taking the heat out of the atmosphere literally. Space has to be industrialized if 11 billion people are gonna survive on this planet in 15 years time. What about beyond communication? What does it mean for, for us actually visiting space for the normal everyday person actually being in the skies? Well, I think as a result of what Galactic is doing at the moment, different to Blue Origin. The thing about the galactic system is it's the prototype 
for being able to travel around the planet outside the atmosphere and not use the precious atmosphere for taking people from one side of the planet to the other. It's the beginning of, of, of hypersonic travel. There are companies developing motors which will allow a galactic type ship in a few years time to travel at three or 4,000 miles an hour around the planet, 8,000 kilometers an hour. And that's like the reaction engine being developed in the UK at the moment. And there'll be a huge change in investment. What people will be able to do is start investing in these space companies directly in a way they've only been able to do with a couple of SPACs in America to date, like Virgin Galactic. Our own investment company, we raised $200 million on Friday, 150 million pounds, and it starts trading on the London stock market on Wednesday. And we're going to be investing in a range of new startups in space. And the public are going to see that happening. So they'll be able to go because they'll be able to fly regularized in 15 years' time at much lower prices. You know, one of your um, com commentators mentioned earlier about the early flights, the first non-stop transatlantic flights on the Boeing 314 Clipper by Pan Am and the early British Airways in 1939 cost the equivalent day of $100,000 a ticket mm. for the 35 people that went on each flight. They were the space tourists of their day. And these space tourists today will herald the regularization of space and an industrial revolution at every level. Now, the pictures you're seeing on screen, this is from Virgin Galactic's live feed. We're still waiting for the feed from the spacecraft itself to begin. We understand there are 21 different cameras on board, so we're going to see it from all angles. Hopefully, we'll get some animation. We will get some commentary from the folks on board. Will, I want to ask you about uh, Branton's motivation, uh, his personal motivations here. Obviously, he's talked about how he was inspired to do this by uh, the Apollo mission to the moon. What do you make of the fact that, that he's doing this just days before uh, Jeff Bezos announced he would be doing the same thing on, on July 20th? I know Branson has said it's, it's not a competition, that there is room for many tourism com space tourism companies. Bezos has wished him well, uh, yet there has been some um, sparring back and forth between the two companies. Well, I think it's been very unfortunate because it's a simple fact which Jeff Bezos's team don't seem to understand. NASA's definition of space is 50 miles. The FAA's definition of space is 50 miles. You've always got your astronaut wings when you get above 50 miles. So that's good enough for me, but it's good enough for NASA and the US government. And the Kármán line was a kind of false creation anyway in the early 60s. I remember the famous Chuck Yeager, who was a friend of mine, telling me that he'd been in 1960 to a conference of the, the Federation Avionique International in Spain, when everybody had agreed, and the FAI did itself, that 50 miles was the definition. So I'm sticking with that one. And as for competition, I mean, there's room for all these systems. SpaceX, Blue Origin, Virgin Orbit, Virgin Galactic are heralding a lower cost access to space and that industrial revolution that I and others are going to be investing in. So we're about now 15, 20 minutes into the flight. Uh, as we understand it, that's the mothership Eve carrying the VSS Unity uh, between those two fuselages. Uh, about 50 minutes into flight, that spaceship will drop below the mothership and then rocket up into space. So we're expecting that to be somewhere uh, between you know, 20, 30 minutes or so from now. Well, talk to us a little bit about the technology here, because Virgin Galactic is taking a very different approach to Blue Origin, which is the much more traditional looking vertical up and down rocket. And, and this is the result of many choices that you and your team and Branson's team made over the years. Um, very innovative technology, the signature feathering technology that belongs to Virgin Galactic. Talk to us about what makes that so important. But what you have to remember about Spaceship Two is it can be developed. This first version is piloted. There's going to be a Spaceship Three and a Spaceship Four and a Spaceship Five. And they're all designed to be able to fly into space and use new motor technology and new ideas in the future. So the thing about the galactic system is it can really be developed. It can go higher, faster. It can do more things. It can do more suborbital science. It can carry AI robots into space in the future as will Orbit be able to do with the kind of satellites we can carry. So I think the difference is, is that Richard has developed a technology based on aerospace principles that can be developed. I'm not so sure about Blue Origin because I just don't know enough about it. 
But to me, it looks like they'd have to design a completely new rocket to do the next thing. Will Whitehorn, I'm afraid former, former Virgin Galactic president, thank you so much for taking the time and for joining us for our special coverage. For our audience live on Bloomberg TV, on a Bloomberg Radio and watching us on Quick Take. This is our special coverage of Richard Branson's flight into space. Let's go now again to Ed Ludlow, who's at Spaceport America in the New Mexico desert near Truth or Consequences. It's about 160 miles south of Albuquerque in southern New Mexico. Ed, um, give us an update about what's been happening in the last half hour as Eve and Unity continue to make their way up to 50,000 feet uh, for uh, that uh, uh, detachment of the two planes. Yeah, so we just passed the 32,000 feet mark. Most commercial airplanes go in a range of 32 to 40,000 feet, right? So it's gone past that normal line, and now we're getting into high altitude territory before that release at around 45,000 to 50,000 feet. What they've been doing here on the ground is playing back messages from some of the key personnel within Virgin Galactic, including another message from CEO Michael Colgate. So it's basically just talking about how much this means to all of the staff. You know, this is only the 22nd time that the Unity has conducted some sort of test mission. BMS Eve, or the technology that BMS Eve is based on, has flown a couple of hundred, almost 300 mi test missions, but not always with BSS Unity attached. And, you know, the spirit here is, is one of celebration, but there is some tense feeling as well because we still have a long way to go in the mission. Right, and it's not just Branson who's a first timer. I understand a couple of the others on board are also first timers, so a, a huge moment for them. And I wanna talk a little bit about the business because the goal here is yes, to give anyone and everyone the opportunity to go up into space, but also to make money. Talk to us about the business model and what Richard Branson, you imagine, has planned. Well, you just asked Will about the t technology. Why use this dual system? And a lot of it is based on the economics of it. As I said, it's carbon composite based, very lightweight. That makes it very fuel efficient. As we know, they're charging around $250,000 a seat as a civilian astronaut, a paying customer. You can get six people on board, so 1.5 million a pop. When Virgin Galactic did the SPAC deal uh, with Chamath SPAC back in 2019, in the S4, we got a lot of detail. The, the cost per flight comes out at around $400,000 to $500,000. If you're bringing in $1.5 million a pop, you're getting very good margin on a per launch basis outside of your R&D and manufacturing costs. And so that's what the future is that Virgin Galactic is trying to sell. They're talking about manufacturing these things cheaply here in the state of New Mexico. I actually spoke to the state's governor earlier this morning, and she said that's the next phase of their negotiations, making sure that the factory where both VMS Eve and VSS Unity will be built will be here in New Mexico. And, and as, as they build more and they ramp up their activity, they're doing these launches at volume, the economics start to make more sense. Although you do have to wonder, how many people are there out there that have $250,000 lying around for a mission like this, for a trip like this? I certainly don't. <laughs> yeah, uh, you and me both, my friend. Ed Ludlow joining us live from the ground at Spaceport America near Truth or Consequences, New Mexico. Ed, sit tight because we're gonna be coming back to you in uh, just a minute. Joining us now is Lisa Rich, managing partner at Hemisphere Ventures. This is an early stage venture capital firm. It's focused on frontier technology. The company is invested in 17 different space companies. Uh, Lisa, it's great to see you this morning. Uh, as somebody who follows the space so closely, who's invested in many space companies, what are you feeling right now? Well, thank you for having me today. This is a watershed moment for the space sector. Uh, I think everyone in the community is celebrating because it's opening the door for commercial business. Uh, we're seeing a transition occurring here where it's not just government sending astronauts to space, but a commercial company and the opportunity for citizens to become astronauts. Um, this has never happened before on U.S. soil, and, and now this is uh, the beginning, uh, and we're watching it live. So it's, it's a great day here for the space sector. Now, Lisa, you have talked about the space launch party experience, and as I understand it, the belief is that there will be a whole space ecosystem that develops around um, spaceports, restaurants, hotels, people who decide they want to do this, they, they get to see some celebrities along the way. What's your vision for the future of that ecosystem? 
Thank you, Emily. That's such a great question because we experienced this last week or two weeks ago at the Transporter 2 launch. SpaceX was hosting us. We were rescheduled for launch three times and everyone had a wonderful time together because we all made the most of it. And, uh, you know, what do you do while you're uh, scheduled for a launch and maybe there's a weather delay or there's some, you know, strange thing that happens. You know, the second launch was cut at uh, T minus 11. So you never know what can happen, but obviously everyone that is anticipating a launch wants to be entertained and have that time together. And there's so much that space enthusiasts want to discuss um, that uh, it, is a, it is a time to build community. And I've, I've met so many Virgin ticket holders over the years. And by the way, every one of them has told me that the 250,000 they've spent waiting has been paid for itself 10 times over because of the experiences that they have shared over the years in anticipation of uh, this becoming an event that, uh, you know, everyone can go to space. So um, that's that's something to think about is it is the, the ecosystem that's being built um, while you're waiting for a launch. There are, there's a drive right now, design firms, um, uh, in, industrial designers coming together to plan and build spaceports uh, so that you have this, you know, more than the first class lounge experience at the airport, obviously, but entertainment and restaurants and dining and hotels, all of that is a, is a big draw uh, for these events that will be part of our future. You're watching our special coverage of Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson's flight into space. He is on board now with five others, including two pilots and three additional crew members. Lisa, you are also investing in a company called Axiom Space, which is focusing on orbital flights that would take space tourists around the Earth. We should emphasize that Virgin Galactic's technology, Blue Origin's technology, they're working on suborbital flights that go to the edge of space or just into space and then immediately come back down. Why do you imagine folks would want to pay for that when ultimately they could potentially pay for orbital flights like the ones you're investing in? Yeah, and and the or the orbital opportunity uh, you've seen the uh, SpaceX having their uh, for inspiration plan to be orbiting in space. But uh, what Axiom has that's entirely unique is access to the International Space Station. So you're not just uh, orbiting, but you are docking and having a 10-day experience on the International Space Station as a citizen astronaut. So talk about the full-fledged end-to-end experience of spaceflight, uh, that's what Axiom can provide, and their first flights are happening in uh, 2022 with Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, and as well a next flight and crew scheduled uh, with Peggy Whitson, astronaut Peggy Whitson. So um, you've got private astronauts lining up, and it's $55 million for that experience. But if you think about it, uh, the auction a week or so ago um, for 30 million to go with Bezos on his uh, inaugural flight, um, you might get uh, you know, a great experience with Axiom to spend 55, a little bit more money, <laughs> uh, for a 10-day experience uh, viewing the Earth from space, which I think is just transformational. And every astronaut I've met has said so. It has changed their life and all of their, their future vision for how they're going to live their life after they have an experience of the Earth from space. Yeah, 55 million, a little more than 27 million for, for a small number of people, I think, Lisa. I, I do wonder uh, about that price tag. Does it come down uh, ever? Or because this is dependent on the International Space Station, a, an entity that is, is overseen by many different governments around the world. It's the International Space Station, after all. Uh, does, that, does that price just continue to climb? Well, well, it's an excellent point because, as we know, the International Space Station is reaching its end of life. It is set to be decommissioned, I think, at this point in 2028. So you have a space station that that will be replaced, and the company that is replacing the space station is Axiom Space that is attaching a module to the International 
International Space Station and building a new space station on top of the old space station. So as they build Axiom Station, we're going to have a commercial space station that has reduced costs and many new efficiencies uh, to it. And I expect that the costs of commercial space flight will come down as a result of that as well. So we have a lot to look forward to in the space sector um, for human space flight. All right, Lisa Rich, a longtime space investor, thanks so much for joining us today and sharing your insights. I want to get back to our Ed Ludlow, who's on the ground. In truth or consequences, New Mexico has seen the flight take off. Ed, where are we in flight? Uh, and as I understand it, there are two empty seats on, on the spacecraft. Why not a fully filled spacecraft, given the desire of, of so many people to eventually get up there? Yeah, we're about 30 minutes in at the 45 minute mark. That's when we expect VSS Unity to separate from VMS Eve, the dual fuselage airplane that's carrying it to that high altitude of 50,000 feet. Why only four passengers instead of six? Yes, Richard Branson is on board to test the civilian paying customer experience, but this is very much a test. Remember that the reason they were able to do this flight is because the previous test on May 22nd yielded such good data. They immediately landed on the 22nd, handed that data over to the FAA, and it was that which led to the FAA giving them the license to be able to operate taking, paying civilian customers up to space. But it is a test, and you know, you have to control what you can. As I said, those four passengers, along with the two pilots, have been trained in emergency procedures. There are parachutes on board. They've been trained in how to use them and also other uh, procedures in the event of an emergency. So we're just watching now for this key moment in about 10 to 12 minutes time for that separation. But as, as it stands, they're still climbing towards that 50,000 feet level. For our audience live on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio and Quick Take, this is our special coverage of Richard Branson's flight into space. Uh, Ed, for those who are just joining us now, take us through exactly what happens in the next 12 to, to 15 minutes and then beyond. Yeah, so the separation is the key moment. VMS Eve is that funny looking dual fuselage airplane. At 50,000 feet, the control room will call three, two, one, release, release, release. For a brief moment, VSS Unity will free fall and suddenly its single rocket motor will ignite. And for within eight seconds, it will hit supersonic speed. It's about a 70, 70 second burn where it will reach a top speed of 2,600 miles. It's a very steep arc that it takes to Apogee, its highest point from the Earth, which is about 50 miles. It could be as much as 54, 55 miles, but it's within that range. And then those astronauts will experience weightlessness. They'll actually unbuckle themselves and float around in the cabin. One of them uh, will conduct a scientific experiment. Richard Branson is there just to explain when he gets back down what it feels like. It really is in some ways a sales exercise. Then they buckle back up, back up and that feathering process starts and they gently come back down to earth, hopefully. Uh, again, we're watching Virgin Galactic's live feed on the left-hand side here. We're waiting for the live pictures of those 21 cameras on board to kick in, which, you know, perhaps that'll happen, Ed, uh, when the spacecraft separates from the EVE. You mentioned earlier uh, the risks, the risks that have gone into this incredible journey. There are parachutes on board. Talk to us about Plan B, Plan C, Plan D. Yeah, there are safety mechanisms built into the design of the system. The engine on VSS Unity, the rocket, for want of a better expression, can be shut off at any time. And remember that the landing process, there is no additional propulsion. It is simply aerodynamics and gravity that brings VSS Unity back down to Earth. So if they did have to abort, then that's what would happen. The engine would be shut off and then slowly it would glide back down to Earth using the aerodynamics of the wings. The thing, the difference in uh, distinguishing between the Kármán line, 62 miles above Earth and 50 miles NASA, the point is, yes, you are in a vacuum, but you're still within the pool of, of Earth's gravitational field. So, you know, all you had to do is stop your momentum and with that feathering process, the main function of the feathering is simply to reorient 
the VSS Unity, and that in itself starts that descent back down into Earth's atmosphere. I want to bring back in Chad Anderson, Space Capital Managing Partner, Ed Ludlow, that was joining us just now on the ground in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, from Spaceport America. Sit tight, Ed, because we're going to be coming back to you in just a few minutes. Um, Chad, what is the role that government plays in, in space flight, specifically U.S. space flight moving forward? Because if, if we think back to the traditional role, this was, this was something that was taken on by NASA from, from governments, um, just a handful of them that, that have been to space. Uh, but is that era over? This is a huge benefit. All these commercial activities are a huge benefit for NASA. We have huh. been operating in space for decades, but this has really only been a category for investors over the last 10 years. And it was SpaceX that really broke through the deadlock um, that the defense contractors had on this market, which was very limited market. I mean, on, on the one hand, you had a handful of defense contractors, and on the other hand, you had the government. And that was the whole market. And so um, it, it, the, the pricing was all over the place. Um, the costs were extremely high. Everything that was built was built for a very sophisticated government customer. And so this really limited our, our capability and the, in, in, in the innovation that we saw in, in, in the category. But, but given that investors have invested in these companies, they wanna see some sort of return. Does that limit the bets that these companies can take in a way that the government wouldn't have to hold back if it wanted to make big bold bets. I'm thinking Mars here. No, so the 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 government is benefiting from these these new capabilities that are coming online. I mean, you had the de the the defense contractors were getting um, very comfortable, right? And innovation wasn't happening at a pace that we're seeing today. Um, what's happened over the last 10 years is the comparison is night and day. And the government gets to benefit from that because no longer are the, do they need to be the benefactor that is funding the development of these systems that are going to take us to low Earth orbit. Um, now those, those operations, which are routine, and we've done plenty of times before, can be handed over to private companies. They're going out and raising capital, venture capital dollars, um, and building these systems that NASA can then just be a customer of, one customer of many customers in a thriving marketplace. This is, is driving innovation and bringing costs down. The, there's been a lot of back and forth about Branson versus Bezos and like the competition that's happening here. This is definitely, no doubt about it, this is a competition. I mean, going 20 years of effort, going you know, 11 days apart from each other, like this is a competition, but it's competition. We are witnessing it, it it's driving progress and we're witnessing it right now. And so the, the, the government benefits, NASA benefits, and we benefit, all of us get benefit from this because what's happening now, I mean, the pace of innovation that's happening at some of these companies, particularly with SpaceX and Starship, Starship is going to fundamentally change the way that we operate and interact with space. The two things that have defined space to this point have been, um, it's hard to get to and it's expensive. And with Starship, those things go away. You can carry a huge amount of capacity to, um, to orbit and beyond. It can refuel and it can go to the moon and it can go to Mars and it can land us there. And I think Starship's gonna be the vehicle that takes us to the moon, takes NASA to the moon in the 2024 type timeframe. And you have to think about, you know, all, all everything else that, that comes with that, not just going to these destinations, but all the other capabilities that this brings online. Chad, uh, we're just getting word from Virgin Galactic that we're about nine minutes away now from separation, when the VSS <laughs> Unity will drop from EVE and rocket up into space. Speaking of the competition, the debate here is that uh, Carmen line, 62 miles above sea level, that's where Jeff Bezos will be flying on July 20th. Uh, Richard Branson, this flight today will be going somewhere above 50 miles above sea level. The last test flight, I believe, went 54 to 56 miles above the Earth's surface. We don't know just exactly how far, but it'll be above 50 and below uh, 62. Um, so that is where the debate comes in. NASA and the US military define space as 50 miles above sea level, and that's how Virgin Galactic likes to define it as well. I wanna know a little bit more about this space ecosystem that you've been investing in. If this flight today is successful, if Blue Origin's flight on July 20th is successful, what does that mean for the ecosystem of companies that you've been working with that are depending on progress here, that are depending on these milestones being hit to get to the moon, to get to Mars and beyond? 
I mean, so this is all relatively new from an investor um, uh, perspective, a category for investors to participate in. It's really over the last 10 years and really over the last five years. And there's been a massive amount of innovation and activity and investor interest and participation. So um, we've got some preliminary numbers for Q2 in, and it looks like there was $10 billion invested in Q2 in the space economy. And um, almost half of that went to infrastructure companies, the launch um, vehicles and satellite hardware that is generating data and generating these types of experiences. And we're really, you know, as a seed stage investor in this category, what we're really interested in is the types of applications that are going to be, going to be built on top of this infrastructure. And that's really where a lot of the value for investors comes from. So we're watching that very closely. And just to give you a sense, you know, 10 years ago, there was no um, gone from literally, you know, uh, basically zero investment into this category, um, private investment into, into private commercial space companies. Now there's been $200 billion invested into over 1,500 companies over the last 10 years. So we're really on an exponential curve here. Um, again, there's been, you know, people are really starting to pay attention now because it's all sort of coming to fruition, but this is the result of, you know, 5, 10, 20 years of effort that's really all coming together at the same time, and a lot of that's being driven by more participation, more competition, which drives innovation and drives progress. The spacecraft now hitting 45,000 feet. We're hearing about five minutes away from launch, currently traveling 345 miles an hour. And again, when that rocket drops, it's going to accelerate to Mach 3 or three times the speed of sound in a matter of eight seconds. You've been looking at video of all the folks on board, a first time for Richard Branson going into space, first time for uh, Sarishi Banla, uh, who's running a research project on the flight, as well as Colin Bennett, the lead operations engineer. Also on board is Beth Moses, who's running the astronaut experience, making sure everything goes well uh, for these folks. And two pilots who I understand are career pilots, uh, NASA, the sort of uh, right stuff kind of guys. Um, Chad, talk to us about the demand. How many people do you think really want this opportunity? Certainly, it depends on cost. Let's hope it comes below $250,000 for a ticket. But what do you imagine, you know, real world folks um, will actually want to pay and how many of them will actually want to take this chance, take this risk? As you mentioned, I mean, they've announced 700 people that have paid this price. And really interestingly, um, they have held on throughout this entire period, right? I mean, they've, some of these people have put down deposits many years ago, and the majority of them are hanging on, um, even through all the ups and downs throughout the test program. So these people really want to go. And, um, you know, we'll have to wait until hear what his announcement is. Maybe they've got some more numbers there. We'll have to wait and see. I'm really interested to hear, and we might not. I think Blue Origin's probably going to keep this um, to themselves. But they have all of the data that came from their pricing auction that's going to inform what they charge um, per seat. And I think that that was a really interesting market survey. You know, that if we can get a look at that, that'll tell us a lot about um, how many people and what they're willing to pay. Um, but there is um, certainly some price elasticity in here. And um, we know that, you know, at a higher price, there's fewer people, but people are willing to pay. And at a lower price, there's many, many more people that are willing to pay. And they're comparing this to the, the high-end, you know, luxury experiences market. And, you know, there's quite a bit of money there. For our audience live on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, and Quick Take, this is special coverage of Richard Branson's flight to space. What you're looking at right now, live pictures, including of uh, Richard Branson himself, from among the 21 cameras that are on board uh, the spaceship. Uh, we are just under three minutes away from separation here. We will, of course, bring that to you live as it happens. In the meantime, uh, Chad Anderson, Space Capital Managing Partner, what does tomorrow look like if all goes according to plan? for founders who are interested in space, for investors that are now interested in investing in these companies. Is this that watershed moment where they're going from sort of a, a dream to reality? Well, that's what's so exciting about what's happening right now is that you used, it was 
space used to only be for a handful of folks that had the right stuff. And today, almost anyone can, can participate. So you can, um, you can found your own company. Um, you can go and raise venture capital to, to found your own company. There are investors putting money here. You can, you can um, go and work for a startup. Um, you can invest in private companies. You can now, through ARC, X, and other means, you can invest um, uh, as a retail investor here. You can buy a ticket on Virgin Galactic. I mean, soon you're going to be whether or not you've flown or not, you're going to be at a party or something. You're going to bump into somebody who's been to space and they're going to be talking about their experience. This is becoming very real on a number of different fronts. Chad, uh, we are now about 90 seconds away from separation. I want to get back to our Ed Ludlow on the ground. Ed, what is happening? What will happen in a matter of seconds? Yeah, incredible live pictures scrolling through the cabin, the under fuselage of VMS Eve, VSS Unity. We got a glimpse of Richard Branson. We're less than 60 seconds-ish from that separation. So a small free fall for VSS Unity over the course of eight seconds to reach supersonic speed. And then a 70 second burn of that hybrid liquid and solid fuel rocket engine, taking it to a top speed of 2,600 miles an hour. It goes up on such a steep arc. And when it hits Apogee, a height of 50 to 55 miles above Earth, then the engine shutoff commences and the astronauts, the cabin, the crew inside the cabin will unbuckle and experience just, we believe, four minutes of weightlessness before buckling themselves back up. And then that feathering process kicks in and they start. Let's listen in, guys. We're about 20 seconds away Ten now seconds. from separation. 10 seconds, actually. So even closer than I thought. Five, Again, that rocket is going to drop below. Three. The mothership Two, E one, and take release, off. release, release. Clean Going release. Into space. Ignition. There it goes. Good rocket motor burn. There's Mach 1 trimming now. All right. There you're looking Trim complete. at one Unity of is the... pointed directly up and heading to space. Things are looking great. We are 25 seconds into the burn now, approaching Mach 2. Mach 2, two times the speed of sound. You're looking at uh, 30 seconds, Mach the VSS 2. Unity. Everything's looking really good and stable. Rocketing into space. It'll get to Mach 3 within eight seconds. Three times the speed of sound or about 2,300 miles an hour. That is the rocket carrying... Richard Branson and five other crew members to the edge of space. When they arrive, they will experience several minutes of weightlessness somewhere in the area of five. The rocket will go through its feathering process, changing shape in flight for a safe reentry, and everyone on board will get that spectacular view of Earth that Richard Branson says he's been waiting for all his life. Tim? For our special audience joining us live on Bloomberg TV, Bloomberg Radio, and Quick Take, this is coverage of Richard Branson's flight into space. We're seeing live images right now coming from uh, almost 50 miles into space. Ultimately, we'll get above 50 miles into space before it begins its feathering process to hopefully safely re-enter Earth's atmosphere, continue to re-enter Earth's atmosphere, and glide back down to land safely at Spaceport America. We're going to keep watching this. In the meantime, I want to bring in Phil McAllister, director of the Commercial Space Flight Division for NASA. He advises NASA about issues pertaining to the design, development, and demonstration and services of commercial space flight vehicles. It's hard to describe how I'm feeling right now just, just watching this, Phil. Um, how are you feeling, Philip? I'm very excited. Uh, this has been a long time coming. I can't believe it's been 17 years since the Ansari X Prize was won. We've all been in this community waiting anxiously for this moment. Uh, and I'm very excited. I wish I was on a flight. I have a couple colleagues that are on there. I know Beth and Sarishi, and I'm sure they're just really excited right now. Have you spoken to them in the recent days ahead of this? Uh, I haven't spoken to them about this flight uh, specifically, no. What, what do you think? Um, go, ahead, yeah, go ahead, Emily. Uh, well, Phil, I just want to uh, jump in. The rocket has officially rocketed into space past that 50-mile mark above sea level. That, of course, is the definition of space by NASA, by the U.S. military, and, of course, Virgin Galactic. 
Now, what's going to happen is this feathering process where uh, the aircraft will essentially rotate its wings and its tail booms upwards. This will stabilize it um, and prepare it to decelerate and descend back to Earth. And that entire descent will be controlled by aerodynamic forces. This is the signature part of Virgin Galactic's technology. I want to get to our Ed Ludlow, who's on the ground. He is very deep in the weeds on the technical details of it and what makes it so extraordinary. <laughs> and there you're seeing, oh, you're seeing the live pictures wow. of, of the crew in space. Someone was floating there. It was a little pixelated. But I believe it looks like they're having a really good time. Ed, Ed, what's happening right now? It's just incredible. In that same moment, you noticed it, Emily, the whole crowd here cheered. It's astonishing. Just the concept of a live feed from that cabin back down to Earth and watching it in real time is astonishing. But as you said, the feathering technology is so key. What VSS Unity does is it takes the best characteristics of the two legacy space vessels, the capsule and the winged vessels like the shuttle. And as you said, the wings rotate 60 degrees, exposing the underbelly of the Unity. That's the capsule side of it. It allows VSS Unity to slow down very quickly, but spreads the heat in an even way over that flat belly, which is beneficial and energy efficient. Then when it enters Earth's atmosphere and it's slowed down to an appropriate speed, the air gets thicker, then it makes sense to put the wings back down. And as I've said previously, there's no propulsion assisting it with its landing. It's simply aerodynamics, this lightweight carbon composite that VSS Unity is made from. And, and it's just efficient and it glides straight back to where it took off, took off from earlier today. It took off south to north here at Spaceport America in New Mexico. And of course, all signs are good. We're hoping for a safe landing in the same spot. As it continues its way back to Earth's surface, Ed, take us through what happens, how it lands. And also, uh, have you heard any sonic booms on the ground there, given that this is uh, a craft that uh, surpassed the speed of sound several times over? No, I haven't. I'll be honest, I haven't. But if you saw me jump out of my chair in the control room, we're all going, what's he doing? It's because <laughs> above my head, you can see the jet trail. So you guys are all seeing it on the live feed. I've got the live feed over my shoulder. But if you look up, there's just an astonishing jet trail over my head from where, just after that point of separation with VSS Unity. There's two pilots in the cockpit of VSS Unity. And as I said, once the feathering process is done and the wings are unfolded and become in their sort of natural flat position, it's like flying a glider. That's all it is, using aerodynamics. It's already slowed down to an appropriate speed for the exposure of that belly through the feathering process. And simply, that's why they're able to land it in such a specific spot, say, versus the capsule that Jeff Bezos will go in, which relies on a parachute and is subject to wind, of course. You just steer and land on the runway, but we're not quite there yet. <laughs> you know, there's time to go. I would say it's still very energetic and tense here, guys. All right, we can hear the cheers behind you. We're about six minutes into the separation. The astronauts, I guess we can call them astronauts now, commercial astronauts are back in their seats. So weightlessness has been experienced and it's over and it's time to come back down. The feathering process has happened. There they are, all buckled up. They look good. Uh, and the Unity is now officially a glider heading back down to Earth. Ed, talk to us about what's happening now, what the feeling is inside. Do you experience um, a different sort of stomach churning on your way back to Earth? <laughs> oh, look, there's Richard Branson <laughs> grabbing someone's foot. I think that's Colin Bennett. It, he was shaking his foot, like kind of like a handshake or a high five, but in uh, space. Yeah. <laughs> out of affection rather than out of terror. But I, I would say, you know, <laughs> every space launch has risk, even those that don't carry uh, humans payload. That's why the FAA regulates this so closely. That's why the May 22nd test was so key, because as soon as they landed, they had to hand over that big tranche of data to the FAA. And that's what led to them getting the license approval. That's what made today possible. I did manage to chat to a few Virgin Galactic people. Of course, they were nervous. Of course, there is an element of risk. but as Cole Glazer said, as some of our previous guests have said, the whole point of Richard Branson going up there, yes, of course, he has a passion in space, but apparently it's about leading the way, you know? And if there's one way to put not just your money where your mouth is, but yourself where you are and your money is, or however I want to explain it, then you go up into space on your own tech. I want to get back to uh, Philip McAllister, Director of Commercial Space Flight Division at NASA. Ed Ludlow, sit tight because we're going to be coming back to you 
often uh, and, and, and in just a few minutes. Um, Philip, uh, uh, I'm, I'm wondering about the relationship that, that you think is appropriate between private enterprise right now and the US government and, 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 and how this moment is different than the history of space exploration when it comes to uh, government control of it. Yeah, there's no one one specific way that the government and the private sector can interact. Um, for a number of years, we've been in a public-private partnership with SpaceX and Boeing for orbital human space tra transportation, uh, and that has worked out very well where we share the risks and we share finances and technical expertise. In this instance, for both Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic, the private sector did this entirely on their own. They financed these systems, they developed them, they controlled the design and made all the decisions. And from NASA's perspective, that's just a really good thing. Hang on, Phil. We're hearing Richard Branson speaking Hello. from the spaceship itself. Take a listen. A beautiful space board. Uh, congratulations to everybody for, uh, for creating such a beautiful, beautiful place. Congratulations to all our wonderful team of Virgin Galactic for 17 years of hard, hard work to get us this far. Sounds like he's pretty excited. We're not hearing everything because, of course, there are thousands of feet above the Earth. Like Phil, uh, would you say that Richard Branson is now an astronaut? Are these first-timers astronauts, given the great debate about whether they were going to the edge of space, into space, or not? Yeah, I'm not really going to weigh in on that debate. I can tell you that there's a lot of different kinds of astronauts. You know, our astronauts are career astronauts. It's their job. It's their profession. They train for two years to do their missions on the International Space Station. We're very proud of them. I would just say the more inclusive definition is probably fine with me. More people that can go into space, the better. So they're at 25,000 feet now and falling. How, how long till they land? I understand the total flight was going to be about 65 minutes. I mean, are we just minutes away now from a landing? Yeah, I would suspect it's just a matter of gliding back down to Spaceport America. So it should just be a shoot few short minutes. Phil, <clears throat> Phil, when it comes to, to regulation, at this point, the FAA does not regulate these passenger experiences the way it does when it comes to traditional commercial airline flight. Is there a role for regulation here and, and, and what is it? Yeah, at this point, it's there is some regulation. It's called the informed consent regime where the providers, Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin, are supposed to explain the risks associated with the flight and the passengers sign what's called an informed consent waiver. I do expect there to be additional regulation as we get further into this. Uh, it was a conscious decision on the part of the U.S. government to allow this industry to sort of learn and explore and innovate in this very early stage so they could make some big advancements. But I think at some point in the future, uh, you probably will see more regulation. And I think that's the appropriate role for the FAA. NASA is a space exploration agency, and we uh, do not want to be in that business. Um, so uh, I think it's appropriate at some point for the FAA to get more uh, active in that area. All right, Phil McAllister, director of the Commercial Space Flight Division at NASA, thanks so much. We were just looking at live pictures there of the astronauts, we will call them, in flight, passing a phone around, talking to someone, uh, presumably on Earth. I want to get back to our Ed Ludlow on the ground, uh, where, uh, Ed, will you, see, uh, will you see the rocket landing, and how many minutes away are, are we from that? Yeah, well, I think we're within a five to 10 minute range, but over my right shoulder, I can see VMS Eve. It's just so distinct because of that dual fuselage design. And it's just so clear in the, in the New Mexico sky. I, I just wanted to take a moment. It's apparently directly above us now, uh, VSS Unity. This has been a really long, hard road for Virgin Galactic. Richard Branson acquired the assets from Scaled Composites, the engineers that designed the system in 2004. There were a number of setbacks, including the tragic and fatal uh, accident in 2014, and progress has been really slow. All you have to do is go on YouTube and find Richard Branson videos where he said, in 10 months, in 18 months, we will have a commercial space flight with paying customers. That was all the way back in 2009 onwards. It's been so such slow progress, but they have done things the right way. The SPAC deal 
was such a success in 2019, it gave them the injection of capital and also the profile to move forward with this project. But the other smart thing that they did was where I am right now, Spaceport America in New Mexico. The New Mexico state government paid for every single cent of this place, $200 million. Virgin Galactic paid $5 million a year in rent, but that's chump change in the scheme of how much they've had to spend on R&D. It's really put the company on the map. They have a good rate, uh, relationship with the regulators now, a good re relationship with the state. And it really feels like they're making this Spaceport America in New Mexico a home, a place where now this could actually be a commercially viable business. Yeah, that's certainly the hope of, of New Mexico's current governor and former governor, Bill Richardson, who uh, initially signed that deal with Branson so many years ago. Hey, Ed, um, give us the latest from on the ground there, because as we are watching uh, the VSS Unity descend right now, glide, it's actually being guided by other planes as we speak. Um, it's down below uh, 8,000 feet as it makes its way to land at Spaceport America. What happens after it lands? What do Branson and crew do? Yeah, yeah, I think that the Branson crew and the Virgin Galactic leadership and employees take a big sigh of relief because <laughs> there was risk involved here. There has been a, a tragic and fatal accident in the past, 2014, right? You know, you cannot escape history. What they plan to do actually is they have to land safely, they have to taxi, the, the convoy of Land Rovers has already gone to pick them up, and then they're going to just take 15 minutes with their family members in the spaceport behind me, in, in the Gaia Center, as it's called, which is a very Ed, nice place, by the way. I haven't Ed, snuck in VSS yet, but I will. Unity, VSS Unity has just touched down. There it is, safely wow. on the ground in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, and Richard Branson is clapping. The flight of a lifetime. For sure, Ed. Uh, wow. It's absolutely incredible to, to see this yeah. moment, Emily. I mean, so much uh, went into this, as Ed mentioned, more than just Virgin Galactic's involvement in the early 2000s. This is decades in the making before Virgin even got involved with Burt Rutan and Scaled Composites, uh, the Ansari X Prize and the winning of the X Prize back in 2004. If you are just joining us right now on Bloomberg TV, on Bloomberg Radio, on Quick Take. We are watching live images of Richard Branson's uh, safe return among other members of his crew and pilots of his historic flight into space. Emily? He pulled it off. He did. They pulled it yeah. off. Uh, and his boyhood dream has uh, officially <laughs> come true. I cannot wait to hear what they all have to say when they get off this rocket ship. Ed, what is the what is the mood like on the ground? We heard the cheers. I'm sure there are family members there who are incredibly relieved, given what you mentioned. There was risk involved here, as there is with any flight into space. Um, but a huge success, yeah. it appears to be. I wish you I wish you could be here around me because you know, as the descent took place of VSS Unity. I, I'm on a press riser, obviously, but there's just hundreds of people around me running from one side of the facility to the other, trying to follow the arc of the craft as it lands with their long lens cameras, their own personal cameras, you know, there's cheers. I actually am being sincere and completely honest that the, just the few moments before it touched down, everyone went silent. You know, there's just, the, the air got sucked out. And the moment that it was wheels down, that's when you heard the cheers on my microphone. Because that, you know, as a reporter covering this or a member of the public or a Virgin Galactic employee, you know, you, you just have to be absolutely sure that the mission's complete and that, that all chance of, of, a, of an accident is done. And it was, you know, by all accounts, based on the briefings that I was given by the company, the engineers that I spoke to, the planning that I put into this, that was a flawless execution of their plan. And so now the next question is, well, how soon does this become reality for paying customers? That is the big, that is the big question. Uh, Ed Ludlow from Bloomberg News, sit tight. We'll be coming back to you in just a minute. Ed joining us live from Spaceport America in Southern New Mexico. Let's go now to Janet Cavandi, Sierra Space Executive Vice President, where she's responsible for the company's space programs, including the Dream Chaser space plane that is under contract to deliver supplies to the International Space Station beginning this year. Dr. Cavandi, also an astronaut who has logged more than 33 days in space traveling more than 13.1 million miles in 535 Earth orbits. Uh, Dr. Cavandi, what is going through your head right now? What are you feeling after seeing the successful finish for Virgin Galactic? 
I think my heart is starting to slow down. Uh, I get the <laughs> same feeling every time I watch a space launch, whether it is, you know, you know a space plane or uh, a rocket or, you know, any anything with a, a jet like that it, or a rocket like that just makes my heart go fast. And so I'm starting to calm down. It's always so um, nice to see a safe return for everyone on board. Janet, what's the feeling like uh, when you land? I mean, do you have, you know, we, we say sea legs, are there space legs or, or, or rocket legs? That feeling when you actually touch down and it's all gone well and you're alive and um, you, you, you get back to Earth. Well, I mean, I think that first time I launched, I, you know, I was feeling that sensation of, you know, uh, as we were ascending into space and the rockets are burning and you're like, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. <laughs> so this is going well. Uh, same thing when you come back, you know, you're going through all the different transitions to the atmosphere and coming back and, and landing on the runway. And whenever you come to a full wheel stop and you just take that, you know, sigh of relief, like we really made it. I can't believe this really happened. It was an amazing experience and we landed safely and thank God that everything was well like that. So it, it, it is a relief. You do have some space legs. Uh, the longer you stay in space, you actually go up in orbit and you live in space for a few days. It is a little bit harder coming back to earth. It's um, it's sort of like giving getting off of a ship when you've been on at sea for a long time and then you get off of the ship and then it feels like the ground is moving. It's the same sensation when you come back from space. Now, you obviously had a storied career at NASA, but you're also working in the private sector now. And I wonder what this means in terms of future cooperation, partnerships between the public and the private sector, between NASA and these private companies. Now that Virgin Galactic has proved it can pull this off. And of course, we're waiting for Blue Origin to take Jeff Bezos up on a successful flight, we hope, uh, on July 20th. What happens next in terms of this cooperation between governments and private companies? Yeah, so you're right. I was at NASA for 25 years, so I was on the other side for that period of time. And uh, after I retired from NASA, I wanted to do something in the private sector to help make space more acceptable or accessible to the private citizen. Uh, as over time, we will be able to bring the costs down so that more and more people will be able to afford to go to space and experience what it's like to see the curvature of the earth and, and, to, and to feel weightlessness. So this will continue to evolve. Um, I work for Sierra Space Corporation, which is also building a space plane. Our space plane will go all the way to orbit, uh, and we're also planning to build a commercial space uh, Space Station that will um, be available to NASA after the International Space Station deorbits. Uh, and so we're working on taking crew and cargo to that space station. Uh, and we also are under contract to take cargo to the International Space Station until it's, uh, until it's the time where it can't uh, stay in orbit anymore. What is the preparation, Janet, that, that you had to go through uh, in order to have so many successful missions uh, in space? And, and how does that compare to, to to what the folks who are going on, on Sierra Space's product uh, on, on, on their uh, space plane, how does it compare to that? Well, uh, again, Phil McAllister mentioned the different types of astronauts. I was a career astronaut, so I wanted to also fly since I was a child, but I wanted to make it my career in space. So I went to college a long time. I went through a very intense selection process from thousands of people, and you get selected down to, you know, say 20, 10 to 20 people in an astronaut class, and that happens every two to four years. Uh, and then you go through about a year and a half to two years of training for each specific mission so that you're well prepared to do all of the experiments that you do or assembly that you do on that particular mission. So it's a, a long and grueling process. You do a lot of variety of training uh, between aircraft and underwater training for spacewalks, as well as the academic part of it. And then you actually fly. And these days, people stay around six months at a time in space on a space station and then come back down to Earth. That compares to this. This is, as you saw, that time that your weightless is just a few minutes uh, and you're actually free falling the whole time. So you're not truly weightless, but you're actually free falling, which makes you feel like you're weightless inside the aircraft. Um, and so it's a very short ride in comparison. Um, Perhaps um, Richard Branson might like someday to fly all the way to orbit and to stay in space for several days and, and actually get to see the whole planet 
Um, and, and that's what some of these other uh, space companies are endeavoring to do. All right, Janet Cavandi, Sierra Space Executive Vice President, also an astronaut, really appreciate you bringing us your perspective today on this historic flight and successful landing. I wanna bring in another special guest, Michelle Hanlon, University of Mississippi Center for Air and Space Law co-director. Michelle, you have such an interesting perspective on this because it sounds so great, space tourists going into space, but there are a host of legal and ethical questions that have not been answered that make this very complicated. It's not just about buying a ticket and getting a seat on a rocket, but who has liability for who and, and, and for what. Um, now that Richard Branson has pulled this off, certainly we're closer to that future of any of us being able to, to buy a ticket and go up there. Um, but it's not so straightforward, is it, Michelle? No, absolutely not. First of all, let me just say this is such a great day for humanity. I mean, how exciting is it that we actually are having private companies do things that once only governments could do? And so, but that that is what causes this legal issue because we have uh, all of our laws related to space uh, govern states and sovereigns and, and countries doing things in space. And now we're really, today we realize that, no, we're going to have individuals in space. And so we think about all sorts of things like, you know, there's a lot of talk about, are they astronauts? Are they not astronauts? So that's kind of a marketing, kind of a symbolic question, but it's also a legal question. Because if you're an astronaut under the Outer Space Treaty, everybody, every country in the world has an obligation to rescue you if something goes wrong. And then the question is, are you in space? Or are you not in space? Because the Outer Space Treaty covers space. But if you, if you don't consider... Uh, if some people are saying, no, you're not in space until you reach 100 kilometers. Um, so then what law applies, air law or space law? Just a lot of really fun, you know, sort of nerdy legal questions <laughs> to answer. Michelle, I'm wondering what you think the priority needs to be now when it comes to the, the legal perspective and the worldwide perspective uh, about the challenges and the sticky situations that, that you describe. Um, does, a, does an international community need to get together to establish the clear definition of space and the clear difference between a space tourist and an astronaut and, and somebody who is on a mission that is sponsored by a government? Absolutely, I think so, because not just because we need to worry about what's happening right now today, but because we need to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow. And so what we do today with respect to contracts and how we treat these spaceflight participants, these civilian astronauts, whatever we're going to call them, we want them all to be called the same thing. We want them all to be treated the same way. We want all of the people who become our spacefaring progeny to have the same rights in space as they do here on Earth. And so when we think about, I mean, my, my ideal is to have all of these amazing companies that are sending civilian people, you know, normal people into space, come together and, and create one sort of master contract that says things like, hey, we recognize that you are human and that you, are, you have certain rights in space, you have rights to oxygen, um, we are we are going to treat you a certain way. We also have to think about people who are on the crew. You know, how do we? What are what, what labor laws are going to apply to them? So it's really important um, in terms of uh, we call it the flag of convenience. We don't want people rushing to a country that doesn't care as much mm. about how people are fit to fly or or the crew of that flight or the uh, safety of that spacecraft. We were just looking at live pictures there of the VSS Unity folks preparing it to be towed off the runway. The crew has gotten off the rocket. They are about to go through a medical debrief, all six of them. Um, Michelle, talk to us then about what happens next. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, there's still a long road ahead, even though Richard Branson has managed to pull this off today. You know, it's a very different story when you're talking about anyone and everyone going into space. What do you imagine the next steps will be? I mean, you know, how, how do we, we even begin to, to form new laws, regulations that will govern this activity? So a lot of it's going to come from the ground up, right? It's going to be these companies are going to have, they have private contracts with their, with their particip space flight participants, their, their new astronauts, if you will. Um, and so the next steps are going to be what we're going to see is this competition um, which the press, you know, which has been played up quite a bit, um, is actually fantastic because competition is what brings those prices down. And so the more we get the prices down, the more we have the ability to um, make the technology uh, less expensive the way um, Elon Musk has been able to do so fabulously with SpaceX. The more we have normal people, people like me involved, 
the more you're going to get contracts that look normal, where we think about things like, oh, you do have to, you, you can't just fly because you're rich, you have to have a certain health level, um, and, and things like that to think about that are going to translate and form the foundation of sort of human rights in space. And so it's, it's going to be really interesting because, like I said, we're, we're entering this period where all of a sudden normal individuals can do things that only states used to be able to do. And this is a really great opportunity for law to work the way it's supposed to, govern relationships between people and not states governing relationships of, of, of people. Michelle Hanlon, University of Mississippi Center for Air and Space Law co-director. Thank you so much for taking the time and for joining us with our special coverage. For our audience live on Bloomberg TV, on Bloomberg Radio, and on Quick Take, this is special coverage of Richard Branson's launch and return into space. And joining us now is Dylan Taylor, CEO of Voyager Space Holdings. It's a multinational space holding firm that acquires and integrates leading space exploration enterprises globally. Dylan, thanks so much for joining us today. How does space exploration change tomorrow versus what it was like yesterday, given the success of Branson's mission? Yeah, th thanks, Tim. Uh, thanks for uh, having me on. You know, I think it is transformational because space, which has always been sort of a, a little bit of an echo chamber within the industry, a lot of people excited for days like today, uh, hasn't really spilled over to everyday experience, right? I mean, if you ask someone uh, you know, off the street, do you know an astronaut? Uh, the typical answer is going to be, you know, of course not. Uh, but that's about to change because we're opening up space for real. And I think, uh, you know, I saw several hundred thousand people on the live stream. So I think it really is going to be more tangible to everyday citizens going forward. Dylan, what do you think about the rivalry between Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic? Does one or the other offer a better proposition, a better experience in your view? I think they're different. So, I mean, if you look at the architecture of the vehicles, they're different. One's a space plane, of course, where the first stage is actually an airplane lifting it to about 50,000 feet, as we just saw. And the other is a rocket, right? So the different architecture. If you look at the actual capsule design, uh, I've actually been in the Blue Origin capsule. Uh, it's very communal, it's very large. So it's a little bit of a different experience. And I would anticipate, uh, you know, I, I know these tickets are expensive, but I would anticipate people will fly on both uh, platforms eventually. I think uh, I think uh, they're both uh, both have their merits and both have their advantages. Dylan Taylor is Voyager Space Holdings CEO. Dylan, thanks so much for joining us. Let's get to our guest on set with us right now, Chad Anderson, Space Capital Managing Partner. Chad, as Richard Branson and the team were were landing, you were so excited. You were you were actually physically pounding your heart. You've had some time to recover from the excitement. What's going through your head right now? Just a huge congratulations to the whole Virgin Galactic team and everyone that was involved to make today happen. This was a big, big day. And, you know, you think the, the flight up seems pretty relaxing, the drop and the rocket, you know, all of that's very exciting. And that seems like the dangerous part. The gliding, we, we more or less have, you know, control and, and an understanding of how the gliding works. But if you look at that thing, those wings are really small um, and they land like a space shuttle. And so I have... A friend of mine is a, used to be a shuttle commander, and um, he would tell me, you know, um, over drinks that it's like landing a brick. So, so I'm watching this thing fall out of the sky, and if you're watching the altitude meter, it's, yeah, like, it, it's, it's like just yeah, dropping yeah, precipitously. It has, it has no propulsion. It's, it's gliding. It's gliding on very small wings, so it's dropping pretty fast. And so I'm watching this, and I'm thinking, and I'm thinking back to this story about my friend. And you know, there's actually a in the Museum of Flight up in Seattle, there is a space shuttle simulator where you get to try and land it. And I was there with my, um, I'm not gonna name him, but my friend that used to land actual space shuttles and he crashed in the simulator. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just saying, um, no, it was, a, it was fantastic to see that today. I mean, all the way from, like, like Ed mentioned, you, know, you, you, wanna, you wanna watch all the way until the end and make sure the whole thing was safe. They're going through their medical checkouts now, you know, and it seems like everything was a fantastic success. So, I mean, it's just, um, I'm joking, but you know, it's been a really fun day and, and really exciting for all of us. Chad Anderson, Space Capital Managing Partner, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes, Chad, thanks so much. So great to have your perspective here. I, I want to get back to our Ed Ludlow, who's on the ground, truth or consequences, New Mexico, uh, the astronauts, as we understand it, Ed, going through their medical debrief. What's the vibe there? And how do I get a ticket if I want one? <laughs> 
too. Yeah, you can probably hear behind me, Emily. It's a party here. There's a celebration going on. Yes, medical checks are ongoing, and then those six crew members will have just 15 minutes or so of private time with their families. Time to cool down, to get the heart rate down, and a press conference is going to be held later today. As you teased earlier, Emily, Richard Branson says he has some kind of big announcement. We don't know what that will be. Um, but, you know, we've really ramped up our coverage of space here on Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Quick Take and radio. And just as with Elon Musk and SpaceX and the relanding of their rockets, what this has done for everyone in attendance here, not just the press, but there are members of the public here, ticket holders, family members. It, it reinvigorates America and the world's romance with space. People here are really excited. They want to know two things. When can they buy a ticket? How much is the ticket going to cost long term? And when is this going to be real commercially? We know that more tests are planned for later in the summer. We know that, for example, Virgin are going to take up the Italian space agency for some scientific experiments in zero right. microgravity environment. We know that they're going to restart pre-orders or ticket sales at some point in the next year. So these are the little clues we're looking for. The bear case scenario is that the demand isn't there. Who really has $250,000 for this? But it was a success today from start to finish. And those six Virgin Galactic people arrived back down on Earth safely. And that, frankly, is the most important bit. Uh, Ed, very briefly, what happens in the public markets this week? Uh, SPCA, Virgin Galactic Holdings, Inc., is up 107% so far this year. Uh, give us a preview of what analysts have told you just in a few seconds. Yeah, we got the bull case scenario today, right? Richard Branson went up and he came back down safely. Read the Wall Street notes. You'd look at the stock Monday and see that as a positive. The bear case is that we see the same thing of the last decade. This takes a long time to come to fruition. And there's always the question, is $250,000 worth it for just four minutes? But today was a success. And you'd think that the street looks at this as a real positive. All right, our Ed Ludlow on the ground in Truth or Consequences, New Mexico, after a successful landing by Richard Branson and team. Virgin Galactic will be hosting a news conference in about an hour, 1 p.m. Eastern time, 11 a.m. Mountain time. You can also catch that at Bloomberg, on the Bloomberg Terminal at Live Go. You can listen to it on Bloomberg Radio. And this concludes what has been, I have to say, a historic day in space flight history it certainly feels like more than one small step for Richard Branson and Virgin Galactic, but a giant leap for space tourism and maybe even mankind, Tim. Yeah, so I'll see you on board, Emily. Uh, I, I'll think about it. I'm going <laughs> to think about it. I'll, I'll get back to you uh, on that one. I'll have to ask my, my family, as I'm sure all of these astronauts have. Um, for Tim Stenovic, Ed Ludlow, I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Uh, stay tuned to Bloomberg for more coverage of Virgin Galactic. This is Bloomberg.